Yeah, I think we'll start uh, the webinar. Thanks for joining everyone. Uh, I just want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and New Zealand and acknowledge their continuing connection to land, waters and community uh, with powers of respect to the people and cultures and the elders past, present and emerging. Okay, so thanks for joining us. Hi everyone, hello teachers and a very good afternoon to you. Uh, thank you for spending your afternoon with us at this at Puzzle Live event. I am Imran and uh, you just heard from Alex and we are from Ed Puzzle. In today's webinar, we will explore time-saving research-based strategies to spark engagement and enable effective student feedback. This is the first time we're conducting this webinar for our teachers in Australia and New Zealand. And we hope all of you teachers will benefit from it. So I'm gonna introduce myself first. I'm a school success associate with Ed Puzzle. I love working with schools, with educators to harness tech in the classrooms to bring the best out of their students. And uh, over to you, Alex. Yeah, I'm, I'm the country manager at Edpuzzle. Um, just so you know about Edpuzzle, we're all about empowering teachers to uh, use video in, in new ways, like for assessment and feedback, which is kind of the topic today. So um, give them the tools to do that. So, yeah. Uh, so teachers, we hope you will participate actively in our webinar. And although this is online, let's make it as interactive as possible. Uh, find a cozy corner so we can get started together. So let's get to know our audience better. And uh, since we are going to be talking about feedback later on, we are going to ask you first a question about giving feedback to your students. So give me a second. I'm going to start a poll. And when you see the poll, right, so vote in terms of how often do you give feedback to your students, right? So you should see the poll right now. And uh, let's see what all of you say. So we're going to end the poll in just a few seconds. Maybe people are still joining in. People who are just joined in, you might see a poll. All right, let us know how often you get feedback. And then we'll talk about that. Okay, so we have about 13 people who have uh, answered. And I'm going to share the results right now. So almost half of you say <laughs> that you do not yeah. give feedback as much as you hope to. Uh, well, that's okay. Uh, I was a teacher too. So Dominic here has been a teacher for a while and we kind of get that. And uh, that's why we're all here today. Okay, so let's get going. Um, oh, so firstly, if you have any questions during yep. the webinar, just pop them in the chat. Just click that chat window down the bottom and pop your questions in there. And uh, if there's time at the end, we'll you know collate them and get, and get to those as well. So yeah, I'll right, be on right. the chat. Yeah, thanks for a reminder, Alex. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to introduce our guest for today, who is Dominique. Uh, Dominic Haynes is an AIS NSW accred accredited experienced teacher with over a decade of experience teaching music and Chinese in the Australian New South Wales independent school system, including the NISA High School Cert Certificate in the International Baccalaureate Middle Years Program, or MYP, and International Baccalaureate Diploma Program, IBDP. She currently works as Director of Teaching at St. Andrew's Cathedral School, which is based in Sydney, Australia. Dominic lives at the foot of the beautiful Blue Mountains with her husband, two children, and two Cocker Spaniels. So <laughs> let's welcome Dominic. Hi, Dominic. How has your week been so far? Oh, how's my week been? Gosh, it's always busy at St. Andrew's, but it has been great because the weather is much better at the moment. So that's been nice. That's nice. It's getting warmer, I guess. Indeed. Indeed it is. Not too right. smoky. Yeah, a little smoky, but that's okay. Yeah. We can handle that. Right. <laughs> All right. So, Dominic, what do you have to share with us regarding uh, feedback for students today? Oh, my gosh. I have so much to share. So, hopefully, I can get all of this over quite quickly, but also in a succinct manner that you can use in your classroom. So, let's get started, right? right. Let's go for it. All right. It's not moving to the next slide. There we go. So basically, I won't promise that everything comes in threes in my presentation, but most things do for me. In terms of what I'm trying to purport today is sustainable work practices. I want you to think about what's efficient, 
what can be time driven and thinking about forgiveness and balance. You're probably why, why am I mentioning forgiveness? I'll come back to it. So basically a lot of the work that I do is about forward planning. So thinking and knowing the goal at the end of the road for you as a teacher and for the students. Um, and I try to construct uh, systems that help me and help the students at the same time. So it's not just about what I need. It's about what the kids now need. Um, time well spent in the classroom. I actually use a lot of class time to be able to deliver feedback so that there's not too much time out of class taken. And I use a feedback cycle, including reflection, so that students know what they need to do next. In terms of a time-driven capacity, I try to think about a regular routine. How can I integrate this into my learning sequence so that it's a regular form of reflection? And how much are they doing versus how much am I doing? Um, it's not that I'm lazy at all. No, I'm doing quite lots of work. We all are. We work very hard, but making sure that the students are actually doing more than we are because it's about their learning. The other thing is, is what I'm doing useful to the students and what would be the benefit of doing or not doing it? The third thing to consider is also forgiveness and balance. So this idea that I'm not going to devote my entire spare time to giving feedback to students because, yes, I have two children, a husband and dogs, and I have a life, as do all of us, and the kids do too. So it's part of being upfront with the students and knowing that I'm going to give you some immediate feedback, telling them I'm going to give them delayed feedback, or if I don't get it marked, I say, I'm sorry, I couldn't get that done, and that's okay. Um, I think there are three tips that I'm going to give you today before I start giving you some practical strategies. The first one I've got here, I'm a learning coach in one in my role and I ask lots of questions of the people that I work with. So think about being smart. What is the best type of feedback to give in this context? It might be a summative task, might be a formative task. What's the best type? Is it verbal? Is it written? Is it immediate? Is it delayed? Is it digital? These kinds of questions are really good to muse over immediately. What is worth giving feedback on? What will have the biggest impact? Is this task worth giving time to give feedback? Your own time, the student's time? And have you actually integrated time into your work sequence with the students to actually use the feedback and do something with it? The third thing is, is this feedback useful to the student? to you as the teacher and maybe even the parents as well. The second tip I have is be systematic. So essentially you need to have routines and the students need to know those. They need to know what is it that Mrs. Haynes is on about. Establish those routines for giving feedback and actioning the feedback within your sequence. This is key to your success. Students also need to understand what kinds of feedback might be available to them and what it might look like, which is what we're going to go through today. Um, you need to teach them the signals to look for, i.e. I'm giving you verbal feedback today. I'm going to give you digital feedback via the LMS, et cetera, et cetera. And then think about what tools your school have. We all come from very different schools. My school is an Office 365 school and our LMS, our learning management system is Schoology. So these are the tools that I have available currently. You might have something different. How can you really use the power of these tools to help you deliver quick and fast feedback? And again, uh, anyone that's spent even five minutes with me will know that I am a love Marie Kondo and anything I do has to spark joy. And if I don't like it, I stop doing it. So if I I don't really enjoy doing something I'm not going to try and push that rock up a hill I actually really enjoy giving short uh, verbal feedback I enjoy giving rubric based feedback so that's what I do I don't try and go and learn something else I try a few different strategies and then work out what are my best ones my third tip is be timely for you we know that timely feedback actually has a really big effect size on student outcomes Think about when can you start? If you're going to give feedback on something, when will you start marking it, looking at it, writing the feedback, verbally giving feedback, et cetera, so that you know that you actually have a time-driven point, which is what I was talking about before in terms of efficiency. And think about this question, this coaching question. What would be the benefit of getting this done sooner rather than later? I'm one of those people that got the assignment and started it straight away so you could at least tick off that you'd given it a go. When is it too late? We know that timely feedback to students is actually really, really important for them to action next steps. And that's that forgiveness balance thing. If it's been three weeks and it really has no time to go back in your sequence, back it goes unmarked. I'm sorry. Obviously, we can't do this for summative tasks. We have to prioritize. But when it comes to giving feedback promptly, we sometimes need to consider what is actually useful in terms of a time constraint. And 
how can you use class time to give feedback? So you might actually use some of the strategies today in your classroom so you are not taking it and taking it home. That's not what we want. Now, some reminders. I've got a few books that I'm going to refer to today. The first one today is Embedding Formative Assessment by Dylan William and Siobhan Lee. Um, they, these, I actually think, you know, if you can take a photo of these quotes, these are really, really helpful. There are four key considerations when giving um, feedback, which I'm going to go into very soon. But Feedback should be more work for the recipient than the donor. That is probably my guiding light. If I am doing more work than the kids, something's amiss. So we need to make sure, am I give, I'm giving them feedback. Um, what are they doing with it? And I tell you, the biggest thing I hear in my role is I've given them so much feedback. Why are they still making the same mistakes? Why aren't they listening to me? We've got to flip this around and make sure that they're doing what you are asking. So student engagement is really, really important. Giving students feedback and expecting them to do something with it in, is not time effective. Um, if it's important and it will help improve their learning, be with them and give them a framework for the implementation, including time to do it. Additionally, we should be providing regular interval-based feedback so that students can improve incrementally over time. This doesn't need to be gigantic uh, pieces of feedback. Little bits along the way in the learning process is actually useful rather than really close to the summative task when it could be too late. Um, the big thing would be embedding formative assessment, which is part of what my presentation is about today too. So again, just take a little quick snapshot of those quotes if you'd like to. Um, also what I've found, um, whole group feedback only aimed at a few students is not actually that effective. So if you give everyone the same feedback on the screen and it really only pertains, like seven kids are gonna benefit from it, you actually need to um, target those seven kids and work with them to fix that. Um, now, I went one too far, sorry. So what is good feedback? There are four key considerations to this. This is another uh, book that I'm gonna be talking about today, Formative Assessment in Every Classroom with Connie Moss and Susan Brookhart. Um, that quote there on the left, information communicated to the learner that is intended to modify their thinking or behavior to improve learning. Essentially, that's good feedback in a nutshell. So when you think about um, the key considerations of what we're talking about today. You've got timing, the amount that you give, the mode that you give it in, and the audience you're giving it to. Try and consider the children in front of you. So when you're thinking about timing, you've got to give feedback while the students are mindful of the learning objective, objective or the intention so that you know that they know what the purpose of what they're doing is. In terms of amount, um, you, it might be different for each student and each assignment. So you need to be flexible in that case. Students need a sense of the teacher's response to their work against the assessment criteria. So utilizing what you have at hand to help them understand that is key. Do they know what to do next? And is the amount that you're giving them overwhelming? I've seen the 12 students receive pages and pages of feedback on their work and they read it and then nothing happens. And what it needs to be is feedback that helps them to move forward, but also not an overwhelming amount that they can't action at all in steps. Um, comments should be made on at least as many strengths and weaknesses. So it's really important that students know what they're doing well and what they could do better next time. That's probably a really key thing to take away. The mode is to do with, you're going to give it in spoken form, written form, visual, a demonstration, perhaps an exemplar. It's dependent on your learning context, but still something that you need to think about. It might be a mixture for your students who you have in front of you. And the audience, a really key thing is making it feel like this is just for me. So when the student gets it, they feel like the teacher is speaking directly to them. So making sure you might use their name and you praise what they've done well, but also calmly and kindly give them some feedback on what to do next. And personalizing that is actually very simple with one of the strategies I'm giving you today. So Imran, I think we're running another little poll. Yes. So what right, are my so strengths? So teachers, there's a poll. Uh, we're asking you regarding the modes of feedback. Uh, what kind of feedback do you think you're strongest in? You can choose more than one if you would like to. Yeah, please do. Very interesting. A 
Okay, we're going to close the poll in a few seconds. So let's have a look at what kind of feedback our teachers think they are the strongest in. So I'm going to close the poll now. Last few seconds and let's go. Okay, let's have a look. Okay, great. Right, so it seems that uh, most teachers, uh, they, they seem to think that they are the strongest in giving verbal feedback. Mm -hmm. And uh, the maybe the lowest score is color coding. Maybe maybe uh, you can explain to us what color coding is. Oh, I'm going to. That is one of my strategies. So I'll hold off explaining ah, until we get okay. there. So we do have another question. And uh, hmm. let's see, let's give it a second. And the question is, where do you collate your feedback? So you should see the poll now on your screens. Do you have it in your LMS? Do you use actual notebooks? Or something else? Okay, I'm gonna close the poll in a few seconds as well. So let's have a look. What is the teacher's primary way of collating the feedback? And it seems that quite a few teachers, I'm a bit, I'm mm -hmm. just a bit surprised. Uh, quite a few teachers are still using workbooks, right? Uh, quite a few teachers are using LMSs as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so let's uh, let's hear more about getting feedback and uh, the different ways of uh, using feedback or modes of feedback. Absolutely. So the next part of this workshop is moving on to these parts that I've got up on the screen. Yeah. So we're considering um, planning for feedback into the sequence. So it's part of the load um, and sharing some strategies that may work for you. Hopefully some of these can be adaptable between written and verbal strategies as well. They're pretty uh, high frequency strategies. I don't think I'm doing anything too particularly diabolical. Oh, I'm having a little bit of trouble with my now, this is another one of those things that you might want to take a little snapshot of because this is Dylan Williams' um, four-quarter marking protocol, okay? So we all want them to do something. We want it to work. We want to save time. This is the way that we've got to consider giving feedback. So I think most people come to the, to the table to talk to me about I have a lot of feedback. I'm giving lots of feedback. And when we start looking through, well, what kind of feedback are you giving? The majority of it is teacher detailed feedback. So that's where we might have marking criteria and we've written lots of things on the task. We're doing corrections, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes it warrants that. That's actually 25% of the time. But when you look at the rest of the pie, you can actually see that you can delegate some of this out um, to students and to themselves because it makes it more efficient, but also it works. It does have a good effect size. Um, not all of them involve you, which is really great. And um, try not to move into that default pattern of giving detailed um, detailed feedback. So hopefully that today we're going to try and move around the pie. So strategy number one, color coding system. So this is a feedback strategy grounded in areas of strength and areas for growth. So what we want as many weaknesses, uh, as many strengths as there are weaknesses, we need to tell the students what they're doing well um, so that students can then see a clear path of where to next. That's very much part of Hattie's visible feedback conceptual framework. So here on the screen, um, I've, I've kind of delineated it out. Pink for think, green for great. Super easy. Highlighters, you can use pens. I have one of those four-point pens that has pink, green, purple, blue, and I use green and pink to do my marking. If you're doing de teacher detailed feedback, you might be looking at using, um, it's best when you're using clear marking criteria. Um, perhaps you're doing the HSC, IB, NESA, school-based assessment. Um, for some of or even formative assessment rubrics, students then reflect on why is that criteria green? So what is the strength? Looking at the piece of work that they've submitted and why is it highlighted pink? Think about what needs to change or improve. So they're actually thinking about the criteria that you may have verbally or visually deconstructed and worked out what do they need to do next. The next three categories are really good. So teach a quick look. That's where you might actually just do a quick look with your green highlighter, pink highlighter on a section of work. So sometimes I say, bring me paragraph one of your letter that you're writing in Chinese. I only want to see four sentences and I can quickly circle using pink and green. Um, and you can do the same. Once you have trained the kids in how to use the strategy, that takes a little bit of effort. Then you start to outsource 
and get the kids to do it themselves. However, the recommendation is obviously we don't get kids to write, uh, do start summative assessments. We do it on low stakes work, like formative assessment tasks, um, but it's a really great way to extend those top students in your class to support other students. Um, and it's also very helpful in getting kids to unpack success criteria and assessment rubrics on their own. Additionally, um, I've done other colours for code, so you don't have to stick to pink and green. I've done yellow and orange, could be highlight grammar. I've got grammar issues in my class, structural issues, maybe the paragraph or text type has been used poorly. If you want to make the work more dynamic, I think the more colour we can use, it actually brings the work to life and makes it a working document. Same problems, if you get the same problems that keep coming up, when marking a rubric-based task across the class, you might like to deliver feedback via numbered codes, which I'm going to show you on my next slide. This is an example of an HSC Chinese continuous um, little assessment task where I've actually um, highlighted in green what the child has done well and pink are the things that the student needs to work on. So immediately I then say to them, what are your questions and the kids can verbally ask me questions or I've already deconstructed using a waggle what a good one looks like. So they know what the key success criteria are already. So it makes my feedback process really, really quick. I might mark a whole class of Chinese letters and I'm starting to see the same problems. This is when you can implement a numbered coding system. So you are not writing exactly the same problems. Again, this one isn't exactly color coded from my perspective. This is back when I used only red. What I would do is I would write the number of the code. So I'll bring up the codes for you. These were all the 10 problems that I kept. I'm like, oh gosh, oh gosh. When I was marking and I marked 50 of them and went, okay, these are the key problems. So to do with grammar, misuse of words, their characters weren't clear, they need to do more revision. And what I did was mark their papers using the, the codes. So then it meant that they could quickly get one of these little sheets. And when they got back their assessment task, they had their task, the sheet, they then highlighted the ones that were coded, um, coded on the sheet. And then they would go, okay, they're my pinks. And then if they weren't coded, that meant they'd done them well. So they could do them green. And that meant that I could then target my teaching in the next instance to be fixing some of those problems as well. So the part of this is making sure that when you do mark something or give feedback that you implement time in the sequence to action it, there's no point in handing this back to them and expecting them all to fix it. It's not going to happen. It's our job to fix it but you can actually clearly show them the next steps and what you will take. And I often actually connect back. I've given you this feedback. I'm doing this now to try and fix point one, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, second, the second strategy I've got here, again, is actually grounded in that Hattie's visible, thinking visible feedback strategies of areas of strength, areas for growth. So a feedback bridge is probably my best one for verbal feedback or really, really quick written feedback because it's essentially three, maybe four sentences. So you can see here, Harry has written me something in Chinese. And what I have done in the first instance is I've pointed out what he's done well. So he knows from looking at that comment straight away, Harry, you've done this really, really well. Please keep doing that. But you can then see in green, he doesn't get it in green, it's just for you, must and so that. So you must do this so that this, when students understand the why and the impact of action, they're more likely to do something with it. You might say, well, that's a year 12 student. It is useful. I've used it this week with year seven music. We've been creating songs and I've been giving them feedback just using a feedback bridge. And I've been able to give all 24, well, actually all 50 kids feedback within the lesson time using this simple sit strategy. And I actually use the insert audio feature in OneNote to just verbally deliver the feedback to the kids. So essentially this is pulled apart in this manner. You start with something, oh, oh goodbye, sorry. You start with um, something that's specific to the student and what they've done well, and then making sure that you have an X and a Y. You must do this so that this, this leads to the why should I bother? If I can't see what the point of doing this is, then I'm probably not going to do it. You are trying to inspire them to action their next steps. They need a reason to fix it. Again, we then implement within the sequence somewhere to fix it. So you bring that comment back. What are you going to do to do your you must now? Okay. Now, strategy number three 
um, we've got here is immediate versus delayed methods. So the point of this is when we think back to that pie, you can actually think about teacher detailed, teacher quick look, an immediate uh, methodology of feedback is where you can give them instant feedback. That would be using a particular perhaps website or something, a product that can help you give immediate targeted feedback. Really great for retrieval practice, checking for understanding, content checking, those sorts of things. That's actually really useful for boosting student confidence and also knowing that they've got the content to then move on to doing more, you know, sophisticated things. So self-marking, that's actually part of this as well. So you could do something like Quizlet Live, look at quizzes, Kahoot, Education Perfect, if you have access to something like that. Ed Puzzle can be immediate as well when you might assign a video. You can get it to give immediate feedback or you can do a mix. So you could actually give it to um, some immediate questions. You can see yes, and then you might do some open-ended, which you mark later. Um, the delayed feedback system is something that I implement when it's um, a little bit more like melodic dictation, for instance, in music, I might um, get them to mark, they peer mark their work using a set of criteria I project on the screen, they then select a, um, a criteria to base the work on a number. And then I enter that into to Schoology, into our learning ma management system, where they can then look at a dynamic rubric, which I'll show you later. You might like to do it in OneNote. You could do a video or audio so you don't have to um, write it all down. Um, and when it's on written compositions or long, larger or longer products uh, projects, that's when that delayed feedback is actually useful. When I say delayed feedback, that means there's time between the action of doing the task and you giving feedback. Um, you can see here in the little yellow square, we should be planning on giving a quarter of our feedback as detailed feedback. So thinking about when you can give delete, delayed feedback on formative assessment is actually really useful. Um, but then balancing it out with things that can make immediate feedback super um, efficient and some of those self-marking, you probably have lots of ways that you can check for understanding using um, self-marking or immediate feedback style things. The fourth strategy is rubric. Now, um, I want to enter into this one with that I have been doing this a while. Okay, so some of the things look, oh my gosh, look at all the stuff she's done and it's really complicated. No, it's basically over years of trying things out and then refining. Essentially, my work with my rubrics happens in January when I'm all excited, everything sparks joy. Right now in September, I'm pretty tired. So I've already thanking January me for getting this stuff ready so that I can actually um, effectively give feedback when I'm on the run, when I'm in, in the trenches really teaching quite a lot. So when we look here, these are the things that you need to have in a good rubric. Now, when I say rubric, this can be a formative assessment rubric and this can be a summative assessment rubric. Essentially need clear success criteria or clarifications of what it is the students need to do well. This style of feedback can be considered teacher detailed feedback. However, once the students are trained, they can move to self um, and peer marking themselves on rubrics. This is the ultimate outsourcing of marking. It's fantastic. So rooted in a planned out formative assessment routine for your class, this methodology will help you work out where you will put your energy. So because um, when you're time poor, this one um, requires planning and prep, like I said, um, and I set myself up for the year so that we can think about when in the sequence within my program, this can be integrated into the learning time, not necessarily into my own prep time. Um, this is when you start reminding students that, that feedback comes in a variety of forms. It might be in a rubric, but it might also be verbal. It might be written, it may, et cetera, et cetera, so that you train them to see evaluation in a variety of ways. They can't just expect it as one. These five key things have been quite successful. It's research-based, but also what I have experienced and found success in. Connecting the content and exemplars to these rubrics is the most important thing. Again, that Hattie strengths and growth areas. So you might give them a comment on strengths and growth, which I'll show you. You always give suggestions for next steps. Students would take the next steps if they knew what they were. 
if you train them really well, they will know what they are. Um, but essentially from year seven, we can be training kids, well, even kindergarten, we can be training children to know what they need to do to progress their learning. They don't just go, oh, feedback, cool. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Um, and again, we always try and voice it as friendly as possible so that students understand. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that this is um, projected big enough. Essentially, I'm going to explain what this looks like. In the middle years program of the IB, all of the uh, marks are done out of eight. Now, they're not a fraction. There's a holistic marking system. That's a whole other thing. On the left-hand side, you can see there's a level descriptor. There are strands. All of our assessment tasks need to knock each strand and know which strands are actually part of each task. So kids know that's that questions for that strand, that questions for that strand. The cool thing we can do, and on anything, you can put task-specific clarifications. So essentially, I say to the kids, see that left column? That's Mrs. Haynes's column. That's the assessment criteria. But on the right, that's kid-friendly speak. That's student speak. And essentially, every task that we do, we write out, well, what does success look like for a 7-8 level student for this hole and then this hole looks like this and then this level looks like this so that students know if I do these things that's why I'm getting that particular level descriptor and using these task specific clarifications is forward mapping of assessment we know the end product is going to be in this case we were describing an image in Chinese therefore this here, here, I have three formative tasks mini speaking tasks perhaps where they describe an image and I use the clarifications as my success criteria in those lessons and in my formative assessment rubrics. So they are seeing the language of the assessment task throughout the learning sequence. And this actually provides them a chance to interact with it and it makes them ask great questions. So you'll be able to see in the next part where I talk about <clears throat> areas for strength areas for growth because at this point we're at success criteria for a summative task I've taken it I'm using it as I plan backwards but here we go this is a rubric that I've constructed using those criteria okay so you can see across like like five levels you might have four levels whatever is useful I've got excellent good satisfactory developing needs improvement okay so you can see here well if we look at strand two you might be developing. You use a limited range of grammatical structures which many, with many areas which often hinder communication. Okay, you might go, oh, well, they haven't said much strength. Ha, you have some grammatical structures in there. The next step underneath it, try creating sentences with one to three different structures. Ask me for verbal feedback. So what happens here is they're told what, what's going on, what's what's clear here from what I've seen, and then what do you what do you need to do next to try and move up one box? And I always say to them, let's just move one step up. We don't need to go from two to five, but if you want to go from two to five, you need to do two, three, four, five if you want to do that. Okay, and they can see up the top in the good bracket, Use, um, uses a range of vocabulary. So we know that they're using X amount of vocabulary. I've already talked to them about that. Try considering... Uh, use of at least three topic areas. So that tells them, oh, if I'm going to describe this image, I need to talk about three topic areas to be better. Down the bottom, communicates with some relevant information. So you've done some good work here with relevance to the task. Um, compare your composition to the waggle. So that's our, what a good one looks like. Um, what was similar or different? Sometimes I pose this next step as a question. So then I get this, two things. One, a kid writes down, what they're going to do next as a result of it being asked the question. Two, Mrs. Haynes, I actually don't understand what you mean about that with the waggle. I don't know what to do. And that's when we have a really robust conversation about their feedback and actioning the next steps. What we want is them being active in this whole process. Again, this is taken from my summative task assessment notification with my clarifications that I must have that are part of my, my um, assessment task planned all the way back through my formative assessment to my learning management system that has this dynamic rubric. So the kids are constantly interacting with what they um, need to know and what they need to be successful. This is just one, one example of it. You might notice up in the excellent column, sometimes what I get the kids to do is actually work with other students to improve their pronunciation because we know when we teach to someone else, we actually improve our understanding and ability in doing 
things. This is what it actually looks like when it's on the dynamic rubric on the LMS. You might be lucky to have something like Schoology. I haven't dabbled in Google Classroom, but I imagine there's some sort of gradebook facility. Again, this is what it ends up looking like for the students. So it's actually quite clean, clear to read. It's very short, succinct, student friendly, um, easy to, to digest. If I wrote those things really, really long, I think the kids would get lost. And when it's formative assessment, low stakes. You want quick, easy feedback. And for me, because I did it in January, I set up my Schoology, got my rubrics ready, everything said, bang, 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 done. I'm able to do it really quickly during the term, which is the main thing. Um, the hot tip that I would give you is if you are working on these kinds of rubrics, um, try and make them as shareable as possible. So as, yeah, share as shareable as possible because what you can do is you can help a friend so you can actually help a colleague by sharing the rubric with them. Potentially, I could take this and give it to a French colleague or a Spanish colleague and say, well, how could we just quickly manipulate this to be useful for Spanish? So you can actually help people with their workflow and a, and a friend might do it back for you as well. We um, have a culture of sharing in the faculties I work with. So this is really, really helpful. Where you can, you might even get super extension level here and think about, well, if I have this rubric in stage four, what might it look like in stage five? What might it look like in stage six? So you have a continuum of rubrics so you can work with this over time. Remember, these are low stakes formative assessments. Um, so you can um, adapt them if you want to, but also um, they're meant to be a little bit easier to navigate because it's not as in-depth as a summative task. The other key part of um, this whole business is a reflection routine. The main thing you want is action from students. Unless they have time to implement what you've said into the learning sequence when they're learning, it's close to the learning goal and they still remember the intention and they actually understand what they need to do next. Nothing will happen. The reflection process is actually really, really key um, in making sure that they're successful. Again, here's visible learning feedback um, by Hattie and Clark. And essentially, their reflection routine could just be based on these two questions. How am I doing and where to next? Or what are my next steps? Um, I think keeping it simple is actually really useful. Students, That's, like this is applicable. You can use it K to 12. It's one of those kinds of things. They're pretty, pretty um, synonymous questions that you can ask. Um, but essentially, students should be asking, what are my next steps as a result of this feedback? You want their action. They do more than you. The recipient does more than the donor. So but the key to success in these reflection routines is you shouldn't give them feedback unless you have intention to build it into the set, to the learning sequence. I have made this mistake for, for years until I read these books and realized if I just hand them the test back, say, read your results um, and fix it, that nothing's going to happen. So with this, put simply, if it's worth you spending all this time generating this amazing feedback and rubrics, it's worth taking the time in your instruction to ensure that students respond to it. Okay, so to make sure that they reflect on it, it's their responsibility. Um, and if you keep it grounded in strengths and growth, that really helps the students to, to digest what you're saying to them. There's a multitude of ways that you can get kids to do this. You could do exit pass, passes, fist to five, rating, self-rating, think, pair, share, mini whiteboards. You could annotate feedback on work, like they could actually write the feedback down. You could question the students verbally as you move around the room, depending on what you're doing. And it actually allows the students to clarify your feedback um, if you allow that to happen. Um, and But the next one is actually just something that I've implemented in OneNote, but you could do this in an act. I've got it printed in my workbooks this year. Um, you could draw it in a table. You could do a Word doc. You could do a Google doc, whatever works for you. Um, I really um, try and get kids to regularly reflect on formative assessment so that they learn the routine of reflection. So when they come to uh, reflect on their summative tasks, they're actually able to do that well. Um, because it's set up in this model of strengths and growth, students should know what they're succeeding at. So they should know what their strengths are. I actually insist the students do not give generic answers in the where to next column. So. Remember, we've actually spent all this time working out the exact steps they need to succeed. I will not have it 
learn Chinese. That's my next step. I'm going to get better at music. Mm -mm. No, I've actually given you what to do. I want you to copy it out. I want you to write it in your own words, whatever works. It's their job to record these and reflect on them. Um, I make sure that their reflections include detail. And then I give them the time to improve. I ensure my learning sequence actually gives them the time to fix the problems but also that they actually have opportunity to fix them. So what does that look like? This could be rewriting or redoing a specific part or the whole task um, in class or homework. So today I gave back one tiny section of the year 11 Chinese exam um, and I made them redo four questions. And they had to look at the feedback, look at my waggle, my exemplar, and work out what they needed to do better and what they did well giving them a similar but new task to action the feedback on. Um, I'm getting them to read the feedback, then complete that task could be a way that you could do it. Um, and I make sure that my learning activities after the feedback uh, facilitate them being able to action the feedback. So they won't do it in their own time. That's really wishful thinking. So here's, a, here's an example of a student. This was uh, in remote learning. Don't mention that. Um, but in the left-hand column, you can see where I've insisted upon a formative assessment saying, what did you do well? And they use the dynamic rubric that I showed you before. So essentially, um, they had to look through the rubric that I'd set up for them and work out what the things were and what, what they'd done, basic, good, thorough, etc. And then in the right-hand column, um, I said, you need to write down the specific steps that you're going to take. And, you know, using an iSmart goal, whatever it is that your school uses is actually really useful to getting the kids to think about it. So this lovely student has gone, um, I'm going to revise vocabulary and I'm actually going to do it with Education Perfect. Then I'm going to use my Quizlets on Match and then I'm going to use my Words I Will Know and I can find those on OneNote or Schoology. Great first steps. Uh, the second one, she says, to improve in the future, I should record a video with, oh, oh, bye bye. Sorry. Record a video with consistent accent. Right. This can be improved by listening to audio resources provided in OneNote. So she knows where to look. Grammatical structure should also be improved. This can be done by reviewing the book and asking for feedback on sentences. And, and, I then ask them some coaching questions. This is not every single task. Please don't think that I'm doing this for every single thing. I pick and choose what's going to have the most impact and I might write back on a reflection. This was remote learning, so we needed a little bit more um, help along the way. But I even read them and give them, I have we have merits at our school, so we give merits out for great reflections because that's actually really important that they action those next steps. That's the whole point. We're working really, really hard. We want them to work really hard too. So essentially, um, the three key things I want you to take away of feedback can be delegated. So where possible, we use these systems, we set up systems, plan really well for the year um, so that you can teach them early in the year and then start delegating out to self and peer feedback rubrics. You might have feedback bridges, you might use color coding. These systems actually can be pushed out so it's not the entire pie is you, it's half them really, um, plan for and include it in your learning sequence so that what you say to them actually gets actioned. Um, so there is something happening um, and students should be doing more than you. It's their learning. I know we work very, very hard um, but and we work hard enough. Um, so I think the key thing here today is to make sure that what you're doing is actually actioned by the kids. These are the, the books I was talking about. They're on my shelf. So essentially, um, this is a lot about our strengths and growth in feedback specifically. These are about embedding uh, routines of formative assessment, which is what I've been doing with these rubrics, et cetera, so that students are getting regular feedback. That's actually one of the keys to success with students. Um, and I was just talking to Alex and Imran before about this trusty little thing that I've come across. It's not an endorsement because I just got it, but this is a little printer. It's called Teacher Fast Feedback. It's got labels in it. Someone uh, recently shared this with me as a great idea. You can look at it on the internet. Essentially, um, I can get it to print a little feedback um, thing from my phone. I can make a label. It will print out the label and I can stick it in the kid's book or the kids can stick it in. It can do retrieval practice, whatever you ask it to do. You can do feedback, strengths and weaknesses, um, two stars and a wish, whatever you put into the template you can get it to print. Additionally, you can talk to your phone and it will type out 
verbal feedback and you can print it and give it to the students as well. So that's just another little handy thing you might want to um, investigate if you have the time. Um, and that's essentially it from me. You just put your questions into the chat. And while we wait for questions coming from our teachers, uh, Dominic, I just want to say, Throughout your sharing, I was just thinking, wow, I could have used that. I really want to try that out. Uh, I really loved how all your tips and strategies were actionable. They're not just fluffy ideas, but they're things I can do in my classroom. Uh, they are based on research. That's quite important as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so we already have three questions about the printer. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that had happened. Tell me, do you want me to answer them while other people are asking questions? Yeah, okay. So um yeah, let, let them know what, what printer, what the name of the printer again. And we actually already have a question, but before that, maybe you want to share again what the uh so the printer is called Teacher Fast Feedback. If you Google it, you'll find it. It's obviously it's from the UK. It's some lovely teacher has come up with this idea. It's obviously their side hustle. Um and yeah, I think it's about $120 for the printer. It's a thermal printer. It comes with 150 labels, uh, but you can buy rolls of 600 for $20 in a multiple eight different colors. I've got pinks and greens ready to go. And then it will tell you how to download the app. Really go on the Teacher Fast Feedback website and you'll see some videos of it in action. That's pretty much what sold it for me. Right, uh, we have a question and uh, this teacher asked in the private channel, so maybe I won't mention her name. Sure. Uh, so a teacher is asking, I have a high achieving student and they keep asking for more and more feedback. I can't keep up, what should I do? High achieving student, okay. So I think this is about that balance thing. Um, I often talk to students about me being a human being too and I have other things to do and I have, you know, I might have 200 students that I'm looking after. So I start to talk to them about, well, and what what's not clear about the feedback that I have given you? What are your areas for strength? What are your areas for growth? Verbalize them back to me. I'd also ask to see their reflection logs and see what kinds of things they've done. And additionally, you might like to have a system of color coding in their workbooks or whatever workspace you're working in where they might action feedback in purple or something like that. I'd actually like to see what it is you've done with what I've given you. They're the first steps to actually seeing, well, what you can actually open up a conversation then about well, what other feedback could I possibly be, possibly provide, um, given that I've given you a lot and I do need to equitably give feedback. I don't think it's un, unrealistic to, to say that to students that, you know, you need to be balanced in your approach and that uh, you have lots of students to take care of. You've got to take care of yourself at the same time. Yeah, I like that one of the earlier points was about forgiveness. Uh, I think uh, oh, yeah. as teachers, we are hard on ourselves as well. Uh, oh, but yes. we have to keep in mind, you know, what is the practice that keeps it sustainable because we cannot burn ourselves too quickly, burn ourselves out too quickly. Yes. Uh, we have to maintain our energy levels, our Correct. engagement with our students. Correct. And I think if you're giving the amount or at least the manner in which we talked about today, using it, even two of the strategies that you're giving here, um, that's a lot. What have they done with that? That's the big question. The donor is not the hard worker. The recipient is the hard worker. I'm ready for the next question. Right. I was a question actually about, yeah. um, you didn't really mention parents today. Uh, I know that feedback makes its way home. What's the kind of logic these days on involving parents or when they get exposed to that kind of information? So so essentially, when you can have a place that you can visibly collate the feedback, so whether that be in the student workbook, that be in OneNote or what other system you have or on your learning management system, this means that the feedback is visible to you, to the student, to their peers and to another teacher and to their parents. Because it's the student's responsibility to collate their feedback in as well as yours to put it somewhere, I find that when we put ours on our learning management system, I actually drive my parent-teacher interviews through my collection collection of formative assessment data. I actually, of course, I'll take their questions, but I'm in charge of that interview and I actually show them that feedback and show them how it works, particularly in year seven. So they get an idea of, well, here's a dynamic rubric. If you really want to drill down into the 10 different uh, learning areas that we're doing in music, you're welcome to take a look at this data over your child's shoulder. But essentially, the child should be able to share with the parents what they are doing well and what they need to work on because of these routines that you've put in place. The student mm. shouldn't be, oh, 
oh, I'm so lost. I have no idea what to do. And when you actually highlight, when you actually highlight this kind of stuff to parents in interviews, they get a bit of a shock and go, oh my gosh, um, you're doing you're doing quite a lot there to help my child. It's actually time for them to pull up their socks and do something. That's that whole mm. the recipient more than the donor. And, and it just takes time. And I've been doing this a little while. It's a case of, well, this is what the routine. And sometimes it may even be useful if you're going to set something up like this for your class. You might say at the beginning of year seven, if you've got a year seven class, hi, I'm Mrs. Haynes. Um, I collate feedback like this. So if you would like to check in with your child's progress outside of the reports or whatever it is that your school has, it will be here. Please, mm. please talk over dinner about it or something mm. like that. And that actually mitigates that parent lost factor. Yeah. If you get that that concept of where to next into the minds of parents, that's a, that's a good partnership. Ab- yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And when you can actually can be absolutely certain that your feedback is grounded in areas of strength and growth and the child feels celebrated, they do Mm. know what they're doing well, because essentially the child needs to know, please don't stop doing this. You're doing this really, really well. Mm. Keep that up. Now you need to work on this. That's avoiding that sandwich comment like, oh, this is really great. Oh my gosh, you need to fix this. Oh, this is really great. On the end, you're actually hearing, yeah, here, celebrate. But there's a whole load of other stuff. That's why that feedback bridge is really useful. Right. Um, do we have time for one final question? Just one more? If you like. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So uh, again, it's in a private channel. So this teacher is asking, what is one thing you wish teachers would start doing? Delegating responsibility of learning back to the students. Build their capacity to let go of your hand and let them actually ask questions and act upon the feedback as long as you give them opportunity to do so. I think the key thing here is I think we think we're the only ones that can possibly, it's actually the kids. The kids are learning. They need to work out what's going to happen next. And when you set them up with these kinds of structures, routines, kids learn. They know how to do it. So be bold and hand that responsibility over to them. They enjoy it too, right? I mean, that's the that's the trick. Absolutely, yeah, and yeah, particularly yeah. particularly when it feels personalized, you know, they 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 know that you have put effort into making sure that they know what to do. They mm. really really value that. Cool. Okay. okay, I think that's all the time we have today. Uh, I'd like to thank Dominic for sharing with us the expertise and experience uh, regarding feedback. Uh, even I, as uh, as quite an experienced teacher, there were quite a few new things I was learning about today. Uh, Alex, over to you. Yeah, I just popped the link in the chat. If you want to get a certificate for attending today, you can download your certificate uh, there, put your name in and get that. Um, yeah, I will be sending this through, of course, the recording and the slides to everybody who attended and registered. So you'll have this great, loads of information came out today, so you can go through at your own pace. Yep. So yeah, enjoy. And thanks so much, Dominique. No worries. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Thank you, teachers, for joining us for this afternoon. And uh, we hope you have a great rest of the week. Thank you and goodbye.